everyone, and welcome to Dr. Deep State. We're going to have session three today of Inside the Medicsy with our friend and special guest, Will from Kentucky. How you doing, Will? Doing good, Doug. How are you? Good. Uh, we've been doing some back and forth this week, and what we're doing is uh, stepping back and looking at this larger project of seeing through the metaverse, the cosmic conspiracy to replace Western civilization and putting some parts together. So we've been having some interesting and oftentimes even great discussions. And we thought we'd share a little bit of some of our discussion with the point or purpose of not getting way out there in one direction or the other and trying to stay uh, inside the medic sea. In other words, having our own conversation, have a sense of balance about what we've been putting together. Um, but in short, how the pieces seem to come together, it's around three dominant personalities and boiling them down into what they're about and chaining them together. And these are number one, Eric Vogelin, who um, we're going to consider the greatest philosopher of the 20th century as far as uh, our working definitions go. And uh, Valentine Tomberg, who we're going to consider the greatest, we're going to put this in big quotes, so don't, don't get distracted here, Gnostic Christian or esotericist or anthroposophist of the 20th century. And finally, Archbishop Vigano. Uh, th or thinking about the present moment um, of this uh, great shift or this great reset in uh, Western civilization or you know global civilization and how this seems to be the culmination of um, a, a long process of rebellion against the order in Western civilization starting in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment in which the chain of, of being when hierarchy, of, uh, of God, man, and society was ruptured with uh, this new um, uh, philosophical uh, uh, structure in which man has uh, stepped into the place of God, in which man can 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 man be his own God and fulfill um, that role and responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And so starting with Vogelin, and I did this and seeing through the singularity, he has this great chain of being and he really goes back. He's, he's essentially considers himself just a 20th century pure acolyte of uh, Plato. But his contemporaries are also these very, what you call reactionary people. They'd be like Leo Strauss up there at the University of Chicago or Harna, Hannah Arndt. Um, these really kind of people just trying to hang on. They're probably doing it of the Judeo-Christian um, uh, uh, kind of culture, if you want to see that strain, and they're, they're probably over on the other side of that uh, Christian divide. Um, but the great chain of being has been ruptured. And so, you know, even in mid 20th century, people like that sounded like cranks, the idea of saying it's all beginning with the enlightenment uh, and so forth. But here at the first quarter of the 21st century, you know, it sounds super cranky to, to ring, ring that bell again. Um, and what we're putting together or even kind of proposing is this idea of reconsidering what the tradition was that was ruptured. And in the sense, what we could do cognitively to kind of think through that. At any rate, for Vogelin, again, when we think about the structure of this great chain of being and the cosmos, our own consciousness is connected to society, is connected to the cosmos. That's from Plato. And so when he thinks of ruptures, he thinks of something in that great chain of being. The outcome of these ruptures is we see it in revolution, bloody revolution, starting especially with um, the, the religious wars of uh, the uh, 16th century and into the French Revolution and, of course, all the uh, domicide, that's death by government of the 20th century. And again, it's important to realize that death, the death numbers in our age, the modern age, are especially death by authority and death uh, by rulers over their own people outnumbers the death of, of, of foreign 
adversaries. So that's the Vogelin stream. And for Vogelin, he's saying there's this connection between the Gnostics. These ancient Gnostics are still the modern progressives in a sense. And they're, they're always going to kind of imitate in the modern world uh, what Christians sort of how Christians speak, how they act with a subtle, almost Luciferian twist. There's like like the snake changing its skin or leopard changing its spots. So they kind of have the sound. It sounds like kind of, and what it's ended up with, obviously, when he says the whole world's kind of Gnostic. When I say this to students, they always nod. Today, everybody's spiritual, but they don't like being religious. You'll always get a nod to that. Yeah, that's that sounds good to me. I want you know, I want. I want to define, you know, which is just perfect humanism. <laughs> so I'm going to throw a ball back to you before I kind of even finish off on a uh, Vogelin and some connections to Tomberg. But um, Will had just said something this morning that I really liked. Um, and what I'll just say it. Uh, what I think what we're before we get into egregores and mimics and things like that, for Vogelin, you know, the Gnostics were about creating a second reality or a dream world, a utopian world. And it's always part of these projects that are connected everything from um, the Calvinists and what they were trying to recreate their own magisterium under Calvin. Um, and that bled into America and so forth and the American project that ended up in American imperialism. Um, but all the subsequent products are these from dream worlds of a you know an Aryan millennium or the Soviet man and now the great reset and all of our faith we're going to have in this new technocracy and it's all the falsehoods for Boglin of scientism and positivism in other words it's trying to create a utopia without grace Will suggested this word uh just before we were recording um how did you say it Will about the sublime uh, so I was talking about in this new um, transmogrification of, of uh, man, God, society, in which man has taken over the throne of God, um, how there has to be in its place a sense of transcendence. Um, so the sublime uh, becomes the stand-in for the... Um, uh, immensity of God and the uh, externality of God, but it's something that has to be manufactured. So, uh, it's a it's a it's a subject in you know German Romanticism or uh, thinking of the paintings of um, Caspar David Friedrich or you know um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This thing that threatens the boundaries and the um, integrity of of being. But it's something that we can harness, we can manufacture, and so in comes technology or the network theory to supplant this um, hierarchy of, of God sitting outside of creation. Yeah, that's really. So in um, Huxley's speech on the final revolution, uh, he uh, diagnoses a condition in which um, this future society, people will be uh, surrender their will to an invisible, transcendent order without grace, uh, where uh, we will learn to love our servitude. And what he's describing is an inverted order that we have through um, the the traditional role of body of the church. So. Um, the, the, the transcendent God who stands outside of creation, who set into motion the divine law and the natural law, and that we consent to through our daily um, observance of uh, surrender to that, to that order is replaced with a type of um, a willful consent to something that has, uh, you know, taken control through a uh, dece through deceptive means, through a type of mind control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, and in the speech, he shockingly says, this is why I like to play this to students. I usually don't, but I did this semester just to get some reaction and feedback with my uh, experiment. But um, he's saying, you know, the oligarchs that call the shots and always have, and it's like, well, we, we don't know that word, but he's, you know, how is he able to say that word? And it's just, that, that's pretty telling. So um, 
for Volglin, um, these dream projects are these millennial projects on the communist side and on the fascist side, national socialism, they're two different socialist utopian visions. Um, and they synthesize into, he doesn't use the word uh, new world order, but it's an order that would come out of the United Nations sort of thing. He's talking this about, you know, about this in the 1940s and 50s. And um, yes, it's a world of, uh, it's man's beatific vision without grace, but it always ends in um, catastrophe. It always ends in catastrophe, derailment, um, because it's not possible. Why? Because <laughs> we're living in God's time prism. You were living in a fallen world. Um, but for Vogelin, there was this place and time, and I don't think he's being idealistic about it, but the world was kind of held in balance. Parts of the ancient world, and it was the ancients that brought in this idea of these forms and this transcendent chain of being. Um, in the BC era, but what he'd call the Imperium um, it would almost be like an age in Vogelin's mind. Of course, this is what we call the Dark Ages, um, uh, but it's a, it was an, a place of, of, of the, the birthing and the pinnacle of Western civilization where the consciousness of man was held in balance. And the top, the people weren't all corrupted at the top. There, to some extent, there were regimes that were designed to tilt the souls of man toward the great chain of being as a collective enterprise. And it's so foreign to our minds because when we think of a religious order that would be worldwide, it would seem to be synonymous with some ecumenical new world order. Um, but for Vogelin, it was a balanced consciousness in the individual, in the society, in the great chain of being that was ruptured, of course, during the Reformation. And we can get into that um, probably another time on Vogelin's take of, of um, how that's essentially a Gnostic project. And again, if nobody's heard of, you know, kind of just thinking about things that way, we can introduce that concept at some time, but it's Gnostic in its project um, because that again, you have to accept certain ideas there that Vogelin again is talking as a philosopher, not as a theologian, but he's accepting the idea within the great chain of being, there'd be apostolic concession. Um, and that would bring the order of the logos into our reality. It's a balancing the medicsy of, uh, of the nature of Christ, the Trinity, the, uh, the, the fullness of the, the word made flesh, all divine and all man. And to hang in that medicsy is to hang within that mystery that we simply can't understand. But it is introduced to, we are allowed to participate in those mystery through uh, regenerative baptism, through marriage, through the Eucharist, etc., through the sacraments, these visible signs of the grace being bestowed on man and society. Um, and that's something beautiful. If a mind has never even heard of the word sacrament and so forth, it's, it's a strange idea. Um, but that is the union in the medicsy of, of a place where the dream world is this mundane place that's a walk, a quiet walk of faith and accepting, um, accepting that um, Christ put a church, a bride in place in the world. And we have a place in that. And we can carve out a special salvation, but it's also a collective salvation. I'm going to kick it back to you because I think I've talked a little bit much. But where we're going to go with this idea when we get to Tomberg and the Egregore is this place for Vogelin is reality. It's a very contentious word with Vogelin. It was for Plato. And it's certainly a contentious word is, is there reality? And be, between what seemed to be uh, competing paradigms of reality. Um, but it is a place of reality. Um, we're going to suggest because your dream worlds and these dream visions can't exist. Or these second realities don't aren't produced there. They're produced outside of the Medici. For Tomberg, uh, Valentin Tomberg, this is he doesn't have a word called Medici, but he in his later life accepted the great chain of being, the authority of the church, after the depths of going into the esotericism, and he found out all projects outside of that were essentially parasitical 
egregore creating projects. Um, Will, I mean, these are some of the strings that you know, we've been trying to solidify that will bring us into Vigano um, because some of what he's saying, um, it, A, if you're Catholic, but not exposed to you know, NWO stuff, it's gonna sound weird. Um, uh, but to Protestants, it's gonna sound kind of strange too, if you've never heard this kind of dialogue and how these kind of pieces connect. Uh, well, did I say anything that sounded crazy? <laughs> things, uh, one of the things, so we can kind of have some kind of point to where we're going to, um, of course, we're going back in time and making some connections with these authors. Um, you know, part of what we want to do is be, you know, kind of relevant. It seems like what's going on in our own time. It seems like there's a sense of delirium or you can use a lot of different words to kind of explain, you know, this delusion or whatever we want to call it. And there's certainly a lot of chaos being put on us in our age. So, you know, a lot of parts are kind of in motion every day. And I think everybody, whether, however, um, wherever your worldview or frame of mind or norminess or whatever, you know, you, you people are feeling that and seeing that. So I want to connect it back to one idea through Vogelin, uh, a la Plato is this idea of um, a spiritual sickness that um, Plato would talk about. Um, and in, in, even in Vogelin, there's a sense of demonic, but he would pick, Vogelin would pick this idea up and he would call it an idios, use that term in history. And he was always haunted by this term. It would reappear and some idea that could be resurrected. But essentially, it was an idea. It's a frame that has to do with man's condition himself. It's not a part of any condition at any time, any political circumstances, economic circumstances, but it's something that can be triggered in man. And Plato would even notice it when he would regard it as certain leaders would become part of a, you know, we could use modern terms like group think, or, you know, mimetic network or whatever kind of thing. You know, where we're going with this is the replacement of Western uh, uh, culture, civilization, part of the metis verse is going to be this kind of what Tehard would call the newness sphere and this kind of uh, free fluid kind of thinking that would be very much of a, a sort of petri dish for the for the the edos in history to kind of come up with all these mimetic possibilities. So just to kind of keep some of this relevant, you know, always, you know, the conditions of our own time, and we're talking about around the world right now, is this, this idea that maybe there's some sort of condition of mass delusion going on. Obviously, that's a theme of today, why some people see it and some people don't. Um, there's also this idea of mass chaos going on, and these are conditions of possibly uh, creating mass delirium. But let's go back for a second to Vogelin and even to Plato. For Plato, he would recognize or identify this sort of sickness in the soul of man that um, Vogelin would kind of call it a pneumopathological disorder. And it's not something Vogelin noticed or current thinkers will Vogelin's pretty current, he's 20th century. It, it's not related to the political leaders or the socioeconomic conditions of the time, but it's innate in man. It's this idea that he would essentially isolate as this mystery of an edos in history, some sort of idea within the thought forms that could give rise to a group think and a group delusion, you know, Vogelin's kind of term. So I'm being a little simplistic with this, but he, you know, that was, that's how Vogelin would term this edos in history that would be part of you know the national socialist the national um communist the french revolution um and it seems like we're entering into this and we can get into this idea by segue of something that tomberg develops very well probably better than anybody ever was the idea of the egregore and all of the conditions that are necessary to generate one. And he's gonna call upon so many 19th and 20th century, especially a uh, French and um, what say Soviet, Russian thinkers that are deep in the esoteric world of kind of um, 
having kind of uh, an inside view on the esoteric uh, means of generating and spreading these things. And we could go about talking about mimetic theory, which is very similar. And in mimetic theory, you don't really need to explore uh, conspiracies and networks per se, because you can just really look at the path of these sort of um, groupthink projects, because it's uh, like a, a sort of mental contagion. And they use a biological kind of means of spreading these disease models viruses and stuff like that. So we're not going to do it too much right now, I believe. I think we're just going to have a little back and forth about, you know, maybe the craziness of what we're experiencing in our own lives. But Tomberg is deep and fascinating. And Will and I will talk um, because we've been unearthing Tomberg and there's so much there, such an amazing thinker that we can't begin to get into it. But in short, Tomberg is going to be unique among all mystics or esoterics that ever talked about the idea of an egregore. And he would say that these phantoms, these um, sort of uh, mechanically developed entities um, can't exist within the great chain of being. They exist outside. So he's really mimicking the language of Vogelin, um, but he's writing uh, a good generation before Vogelin. So he's not copying Vogelin. And I'm certain probably that Vogelin is not reading them, um, but we're putting together um, this dialogue about the creation of egregores. In short, the Medici is a space that egregores aren't able to generate themselves. They require sort of male principle and a female principle and other situational contexts, usually involving chaos and a number of other rituals and so forth. And it gets kind of heavy, but well back and forth because it's once you open the egregore box, we can go down it forever. Um, what we're gonna do is explore it probably, Tomberg and his ideas a little bit more in another session. Will and I were having a lot of great conversations this week. What I'm going to do right now, kind of surprise Will a little bit. He's hooked together. I think we both did. He mentioned in our last video, the idea of the mask and this being kind of an inversion of, a, of the order of creation. And Tomberg even talks about this. Tomberg talks about kind of the, how the order of the cosmos can be inverted or the seven days of creation for he was very involved with Steiner. For Steiner, like Tehard, like each day could be millions of years. Um, and I think that's kind of the mystery of the Medici is that I believe that we can look at the seven days of creation and they can be a single day or whatever metaphor that extends and is outside of time at the same time. There's a great mystery there that can be unlocked. Um, there's some overlap, overlapping paradigms that we can see. And in that way, we can say that there we don't want to say that the Bible's esoteric, but it's deeply metaphorical and multi-layered. And Tomberg is fascinating about the way that he can kind of find correlating languages within that, within multiple uh, religious traditions and so forth, but yet lead it all back to the great chain of being and where Vogelin essentially would too, is the Imperium. Uh, any ideas? I've been talking a little bit there, probably too much, Will. What are you thinking? So, um, yeah, we were talking about masks last week, and we got a little bit into the uh, sacramental economy of the Catholic Church and how it, its function within the Medici of, through these uh, ritual observances and these um, routines and intervals, it um, reconnects us back into the, the chain of being and the, the hierarchy. That's um, good. I like so yeah. one of the themes that uh, 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 Valentin Tomberg uses is the sense of the vertical plane and the horizontal plane. Um, and uh, the, the vertical hierarchical order is something that's innate. And um, he's connecting this back to some of Rudolf Steiner's um, uh, writings on um, angelic hierarchy. So um, the, the watchers and you know, if anyone has kind of done some of the Nephilim research, they've, they're familiar with these type of things, uh, different, different, um, you know, like, uh, 
trying to think of some of the, the different, uh, you know, thrones and dominions and, and things like that. So um, and, and let me just interject really quickly, because what we were talking about this week, where these entities come from, these ethereal or astral entities, you know, it's been in the sort of fringy evangelical world over the last five, 10 years. It's the, it's the spirits of disembodied Nephilim and nobody's necessarily discounting that. But one thing that these writers are gonna say, wherever they're from, they are here, they're part of our lives. They've always seemingly been here, whether it's pre-flood or post-flood. So there is a way that some people have found how to manipulate them. But I, I didn't wanna do that, but it, it might be that, it might not. We're not necessarily, I think that's what Will and I agreed, at, both among the readings and you know our own thoughts on it. You, you can do this independent of any belief you have of the Book of Enoch or, but yes, they, they're they often like, especially with Aldephus, Levi is one of the first people to use the term, you know, sort of in the enlightenment era. And uh, he, he would connect them to the watchers. Right. Um, so this field of angelology, I guess you would call it. And uh, the, the Catholic, Magisterium makes a space for uh, the angelic hierarchies within the body of the church and the mass, uh, but they're also, you know, fallen entities as well, and how they relate or interact with the production of egregores is uh, something that's not immediately clear from reading uh, Tomberg, at least in my estimation so far, um, but it does seem like this, the way in which these um, astral entities interact with uh, you know, human social life uh, is is you know very parallel to the way that the the egregore gets created or the kind of channels in which it it um, it, it flows between. So there's a quote here from Robert Ambelain. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, about the egregore is a force generated by powerful a powerful spiritual current and later fed at regular intervals conforming to a rhythm in harmony with the universal life, life of the cosmos or to a meeting of entities united by a common characteristic. So a lot to unpack there, but the sense of it being fed at regular intervals and rhythms and harmonies of the universal life of the cosmos, you can see this electrical model of, um, of uh, spiritual currents. And, uh, you know, Tomberg has a sense of the, uh, the electrical field of um, the horizontal world. And this is something that is very much bound up in the way that um, culture and society exchanges the edos, the, you know, the, the ideation of, um, of uh, a thought in, um, you know, a collective environment. So anyway, um, there's something that is sacramental in um, the way that the, the egregore is generated uh, through ritual observance and through repetitions and through um, intervals over time, um, sort of how it echoes in the uh, uh, inside the time prison. And uh, so we're talking about original sin um, and the place that it um, takes. I, I just want to interject and have people do a visualization. I like what you're saying. We were talking this week, if you think of the Ouroboros as a time prison horizontally, Okay, but again, when you get back to words like, how did we say, what's the word charming? No, what was the word we began all this with? Um, the sublime? The sublime. Yeah. It sort of uses the sublime to kind of imitate the vertical a chain right. of being. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's a great visual just to think of the horse force and vertical, uh, horizontal as in Tomberg's thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Tomberg says that the order of being is innately hierarchical and this, um, you know, horizontal sense of, you know, um, like kind of a, a collectively generated order is something that is a, uh, it's a hallucination or it's a fantasy. It's a second reality. It can only parasitically recreate that, um, that sense of order. Um, and that's kind of the, the role of the, of the egregores in, in the generation of that, um, that, that inverted, you know, universal life of the cosmos, as Ambulane is calling it here. So um, just maybe as an example, we were, we were talking again about the masks. And so uh, going back to what, what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, within the enlightenment concept of, of um, the relationship of man and God, in which, you know, man becomes his own God through his own will and imagination. Um, the, the way in which Adam was created was through the breath 
into the dust of the earth by God. And so um, this uh, uh, sense of, um, you know, the mask being the reversal of the flow of breath. So we're breathing our own breath just as we're becoming our own gods in this type of ritual sacrament. Um, and um, anyway, we, we're also speaking about that in the sense of original sin and how um, this is a rejection of the concept of, you know, the, the fallen nature of man. Um, and that is and Yeah, and egregores are always a perversion of the will of God. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's it, the mask is, it is it's just think about it it's perverted right right <laughs> that, that's one of the things uh, the way that Tolberg describes it is it's a reversal of the of the polarity or a change of flow uh you know a redirect and th that you know ob that's very you know obvious with the, the mask you know the the natural flow of of um of breath gets you know back you know collapsed or uh, or suffocated so um, yeah, that's it, it. It's very like uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, very much like when you're in the medic sea, you know, that's why you kind of control your passions and so forth. And, and we're at a time right now, you know, where obviously people are trying to stir us up and get us in one direction or another. And um, that sense of groundlessness is one of the characteristics of, of uh, being pliable for egregore formation. Um, but uh, from the mask, then we um well let's do this um we were going back and forth and we were we're not going to go through all the seven sacraments but we're we'll t we'll try to tackle one right now because the flow seems to be going that way that we both were kind of comfortable with starting where we might be at right now in history so again trying to stay in the medic see we're doing this with a sense of uh, humility and modesty <laughs> because we you know so much of this is the person with the new novel idea out there um, but if this were an attempt to a new stage in history, a post-Christian stage or post-Western stage, there is an assumption that we still have one foot in Western civilization. We still value life. We still value families. It's being torn away. I can tell children that can barely spend time with their own families because they're so attracted to this metaversal life. If you look at the description of metaverse, one of the major ones is a game called Minecraft. I can say in my own household, um, that game takes uh, <laughs> much more precedent over my existence. Um, but, uh, but yes, something we could agree on at this point in history, if there was an, sort of an attempt to usher in via inverted sacraments, the, we agreed that what seems to be going on would have to do with um, a, a baptism. And in the Imperium, baptism, there's this huge net. You're adopted into the family. You know, this would change, you know, with the Reformation or not immediately, a couple hundred years after the Reformation, this idea of a believers, you know, and, and that can be incorporated. It works both ways, but that you're entering family. Um, it doesn't mean you're automatically going to have this beatific vision at the end of your life, but um, but you're adopted into, or you, you begin something, something's beginning that through uh, perhaps a chain of consent, you know, confirmation and marriage and, um, and participating on our own volition in uh, the Eucharist and confession, that we become participants in this order of what we was Western civilization, and which is, you know, there's been calls of the breaking away of Western civilization from even before the, uh, you know, French Revolution. But there's a lot there with the baptism. Will has got a lot of great ideas. We can pull from everybody from, from Vogelin to Tomberg. Um, you got you you had a couple of great ones you mentioned from Tomberg, um, a refraction from from the horizontal and um, yeah with the water he has this uh, uh, imagery of like water and spirit and um, how the, uh, you, the you know the the horizontal plane of the water intersects with the vertical plane of the spirit and um, this. Uh, uh, anyway, this, uh, you know, transcendent exchange, I guess you would say. Um, but, uh, you know, going back to this issue of original sin and uh, the new creation. So there's a type of like, uh, there, you know, the three initial sacraments 
in um, you know the, the, the Catholic sacramental economy would be you know, the the sacraments of initiation, which are um, uh, baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. Uh, so uh, there is this initiation that it seems to be going on through a kind of ritualistic death that you know has been happening over the last year and a half through the form of these lockdowns and and shutting shutting down society and uh, dividing families from one another and, and masking and you know this uh, sort of forced segregation of life and uh, then uh, you know it being reborn or reopened through this one singular cha sacramental channel um, of uh, you know experimental gene serum as um, as a uh, Archbishop Vigano says um, and you know in this promise. I, sorry to interrupt there's a new promise it's always just right there that gene editing it's so in your face it's part of project chaos and consenting to this thing knowing you, you, we're not supposed to know what's in it you know there's no liability but yet somehow it's out there that it edits your genes yeah so there's a promise already a foot in the door so we're not saying you know six 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 here <laughs> but there's a foot in the door here to um this apotheosis right or you know transhumanism yeah etc and, it, and it's like you're saying it's it's presented in um, a kind of um, quasi metaphysical way, which it's uh, you know this this magical you know it's part of this reality, it's part of that. It's you know maybe it has this in it, maybe it doesn't. You don't know, you don't get to know. Some people get to know, but anyway, it, that that has an as you talked about uh, in you know many previous videos that has a magical effect and it kind of arrests our sense of reality and allows us to enter into a kind of second reality. It's a it's a transubstantiation. Um, yeah. Um, and so it, it's yeah, signif like it's signifying a new order of creation. So um, in the the ritual of baptism, that it, it acknowledges. You know, this is a big issue for me. Uh, as I was becoming um, interested in Catholicism from my Protestant background, uh, you know, I always, you know, I've got two, two, two children, as we talked about, one of them has a significant disability. So this issue of consent to the ritual or, you know, when, when do I get my kid, children baptized? Should I wait for them to choose it on their own? Or, you know, my older daughter probably will never get to that, that place. So do I choose it for her to, you know, um, kind of weighing out those decisions? Uh, but I, I really, you know, one of the things that made the most sense to me was the sense of the baptism represents original sin, and that's why there's infant baptism in the Catholic Church, and also, you know, mentioned in the early church, in the writings of the church fathers, that, you know, inf infant baptism goes back to the very foundation of the church, and it's this acknowledgement that of the fallen nature of um, our being in the order of creation, uh, you know, from the sins of Adam. So, um, you know, like we we're talking about with the mask, it's this rejection of the breath that was given to Adam by God as a way of symbolically rejecting that that order of creation. It's saying that you know Adam was made by God, and we are the you know the inheritors of Adam's sin. It's it's rejecting that creation and saying that we are the own our own makers, our own masters. We breathe our own breath, <laughs> and so likewise with the the um, the. Uh, this ritual baptism, this sim symbolic dying and, and being reborn into a new creation, it's denying the aspect of original sin, in which now the original sin is being the original creation. Like if you're if you're the ungenedited person who has the audacity to, um, you know, walk outside and be a member of society, um, then then you're you're pathologized. You're you're a threat to the order. So. Um, uh, the, the, the ritual of, of, of death and creation is being rearranged or transmogrified uh, through this sacramental act. Yeah, yeah. And for Vogelin, this was the outcome. You know, he's writing about Gnosticism, you know, heavily from, you know, from the 40s into the 70s, the 1940s to the 1970s. Um, and he, he'd say all the isms are essentially phantoms or egregores of different types um you know and he got a little carried away basically for him everything is an ism and we're, we had to reel it in for him everything's an ism that's outside the medics or you know capable you're, you're you're susceptible to these thought forms these you know the and the thing it is it's a type of paradigm 
uh, it's a type of paradigm that once you're locked into it, it's hard to get out of it, very hard. And for most people, once they're in it, it's, it infects the mind and they never leave it. Um, and they're not able to even have a perspective to question it. But for him, scientism was a big one. Positivism was a big one. And he was already telling, you know, it wasn't, he didn't have to be a prophet back in mid-century to say, you know, this technocracy is coming where people are going to yield to a new authority and a new regime. And, um, you know, for him, that was like, so it was pretty plain kind of coming out of the conditions of World War II when you're reflecting on that in, in the 1950s, when most people around you were probably thinking, well, this is a period of relative calm and peace and America prosperity like we've never had. He was seeing something at a deeper historical level that was brewing and waiting to reemerge. Um, and I think that until two years ago, the world seemed normal. <laughs> you know, in many ways. Um, I mean, post, uh, you know, big event 20 years ago, for a lot of people, things got stirred up one way. And we, you know, a lot of people started having a perspective that maybe everything isn't how it's always been presented for, you know, at least fringes of groups around the world started maybe opening up to the way that events can be manipulated and so forth. But what started happening two years ago, it, it, you know, it's, it's that event 20 years ago, you know, so many times multiplied um, that, you know, at a personal level, if you just kind of just stand back, I, I, I it seems the, the divide, there is no fence kind of, you know, like people are one side or the other, the divide for some people, you just can't open up a newspaper or go on, it's just the insanity. And the biggest insanity in the last two years for those kind of people is that they they look at other people that are just waiting for things to go back to normal. You know, this divide between these types of consciousnesses, people that are in this th uh, group thought and people that are not, the divide is so, so thick. Now, I have seen personally some people over the last two years that have kind of taken on a new perspective. But I think, you know, that position of being able to jump on one side of the fence or the other is really closing and closing and closing as um, probably if you, if there were any, you know, kind of signifier as these um, sort of mandates <clears throat> become actualized around the world, um, you know, interesting times. Um, and, you know, we can get into, this is such a big topic that it's probably better to kind of hook it back in another time to Tomberg. But this idea of um, culture creation and this idea of, you know, putting so much of this out there and this externalization that gets kind of mind trippy. But that is very much a part of this egregore creation. And part of this project is, so a certain percent of the population probably the, you know, the percent that spend less time with the TV and more, you know, more crazy time on the internet are also part of this grand theater of things of the egregore creation project. Um, sometimes I think they uh, unwillingly, we're all sort of participants in this um, ACDC of egregore creation. And so it's important to have, I think, some kind of perspective. And I think one way we can do that is by at least the possibility of returning to a tradition or a space where even if the balance isn't there in our own mental world between us, society, and the great chain of being, that there is this promise that there would be um, a certain place to go. Um, however you want to think about the certain prophecies in scripture, um, it always is commanding you to be at peace. And I think there's a reason for that, to having that equanimity of mind that, um, that there is something even outside of the sacraments where you can, you know, within even the Protestant viewpoint, uh, you know, I don't think either of us are excluding that, um, have an equanimity and a peace of mind. Um, and part of that is probably escaping the culture creation or, you know, the, uh, the sort of chaos 
rituals that are taking place around us. Um, Will, what side of the fence do you feel like you're on most days? <laughs> so, you know, that's, that brings up an interesting concept like this uh, electrical model, it requires polarities in order to generate energy. So in accepting this, you know, bifurcated uh, social order that we're being thrust into, we are in a way participating in the creation of this new world energy uh, and that we, you know, is, is definitely not in our interest. So in a way by um, seeing people who are on the other side of this as, you know, fundamentally different from us or they're being, or, you know, being unreconcilable with our uh, concept of reality, we're participating in the demise of Western civilization in a way. Exactly. I mean, I, I didn't want to interject, but that's really where the divide comes from. The still people that want to hang on to Western civilization and mm -hmm. people that are being initiated into a new, what is civilization? It's the arts, it's the yeah. outlook, it's the ideology, it's the way we see the world. Right. And so the metaverse, you can kind of get taken away, I think, sometimes into something that people are buying real estate in the metaverse. I mean, what the hell does that even mean? Right. But at the end of the day, you're buying into a new outlook. It's a new civilization. It's a new way of seeing the world. And um, and in short, you know what what Vogelin and Tomberg are going to say. It's part of an ancient project of being self salvific, self salvation. You're mm -hmm. going to save yourself in this new space, going backwards. You know, and um, you know, I mean, and so within the tradition of Catholicism, it's these real cranks that are going to take issue with something uh, that was Gnostic within Vatican II. So those are really cranky people that thought that that council was just an extension of the Protestant. It's the same thing. If there's an egregore of Sola Scriptura, there's an egregore of Vatican II. They're outside of the Medici. They're there. They look and that's not to say that there's no truths within them. There's probably millions of truths, but there's a germ of egregore creation of thought bubbles that are going to exist outside of the great chain of being. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, you know, like you've, you've said before, uh, 99 truths to tell one lie. That, that concept really uh, helped me make a lot of connections and understand the world. Uh, but this uh, sense of controversy um you know being a, a huge piece of the final revolution and the uh you know learning to love your servitude participating in the controversy in a way enslaves us and 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 you know uh harvest energy for the egregore creation so uh you know that that helps to explain why you know, this piece of the political puzzle is figured out partially on this side and on this other side, but then these two things are pitted against each other. And, you know, you can say the dialectical science also works upon that, that um, model of, of um, you know, polarity to try to generate friction uh, or chaos uh, that, that produces, a, 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 you know, the synthesis, the, the synthesized um, uh, egregore. So, um, and that's the agreement of what we're going to say, you know, so just like I, I suppose like political correctness is one way to kind of have the guardrails around what you can say and yeah. whatnot. They start with little memes or smaller pieces that build into this ideology. Yeah. So I would say egregores can begin by memes, little thought pieces of what we can say and what we can't say. They can grow into egregores of a uh, accepted way to see the world. And then the egregore itself can be the master. Yeah. Um, so that you, you, your, your will is taken to some extent by that paradigm. There's an, an also an, another interesting kind of parallel in scripture. This is something I find missing in a lot of the, uh, you know, evangelical, uh, you know, understanding of, you know, the times that we're in and the Bible and what the scriptures say, the book of Revelation. Um, is the sense of, of typology and these kind of echoing um, archetypes in scripture that, you know, accumulate meaning and reveal, you know, currents of, of um, spiritual truth. So in reading 
um, the book of Revelation, there's, you know, a preterist view, there's a futurist view, um, and, you know, then there's this, uh, you know, literal seven and a half year tribulation view, and uh, it's really easy to say, you know, pick a single, pick a single camp, and, you know, defend it uh, against these other, call everybody a heretic, and then we're just, you know, fighting each other all day long. And, um, you know, the, one of the things that helped me start making sense of what's going on is that, you know, you can hold both, you know, a futurist and a preterist view simultaneously, and that actually hel helps you gain insight into how this thing is unraveling. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, conversation and argumentation about whether or not this is the mark. And I think in one of Vigano's video, he actually goes so far as to say that, you know, with the aborted fetal cells and, you know, this um, uh, green pass system, this constitutes the mark. But I, 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 I feel like he's saying that as a typology of the mark and, or maybe it's a candidate for the mark, but it, in order for it to be fulfilled as such, it requires our participation in the egregore of it as such, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like our belief and our will and imagination participates in the creation of this, um, you know, um, this. Uh, sorry, I got to pause. Yeah, what led me into this, and it was kind of something that I just played out on my channel, is a millennialism. I realized that that was the only thing that sort of made sense, that view of prophecy. And for somebody that wants, you know, the Bible is kind of a crazy book if you don't do it through the, you know, the spirit. But once the spirit kind of awakens you, you see this perpetual prophecy that's being fulfilled in Christ. And through spiritual eyes, this just only through divine authorship could this be possible. That like page by page, everything leading to the particular mission, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ. And you just see that this is divine authorship if you're looking through um, spiritual eyes. So, but the book of Revelation and the futurism, it gets kind of crazy. So when I started to explore it deeper, I found a millennialism. Well, this is the view held by not many Protestants anymore. Um, it's basically the Missouri Senate put out an official document back in 89 um, within the covenant theology. This is kind of the higher end, most sophisticated supposedly theology of what we'd call Calvinism. You have all three. So within this tight framework of, of Calvinism, at least the original framework was pretty tight. You can have premillennial, postmillennial and amillennial. So as I'm exploring this, I'm realizing that, you know, all the things bring come back to a really mainstream Protestant, not only a view of prophecy, but liturgy itself is embedded in prophecy. So then it brings me back to the church and the catechism. And then, you know, what I'm noticing, it's the whole mass is part of the medicsy. It's there to keep you in the zone away from this creation of these phantoms. And so what the purpose of the mass is, is obviously the pinnacle, the mass of the Eucharist, but everything's around these, it's very creedal. Everything's focused on the eschaton, the beatific vision outside of here. And you need weekly to prepare your, yes, you can hear, and there's a place for preachers that want to kind of explore text for 40 minutes. But for me, Outside of this craziness, I want my mind, my heart, my spirit on the eschaton, the final vision that's confirmed in whether you're doing the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and that the, the priest is hopefully taking that reading that every three years is going to be recycled through the most essential texts of sacred scripture and uh, tightly expositing on them or doing an exegesis on them. And that's going to bring to light always the totality of the Bible that's just pointed toward the you know, the final creation. What we're here for is our apotheosis through the will of Christ and our union with Christ. And that's the egregore that's being perverted outside of the medicsy. But let me, you know, that's kind of a whole, I guess maybe I, uh, a little manic today, but um I, I just to back if I know Will's got to kind of cut it short here, but if you just want to know about, you know, just the craziness and how we all kind of participate in this willingly or unwillingly, even when Vigano can start a sound kind of like, you know, 
a little bit on the evangelical side. He's an amillennialist because he's Catholic, right? So he's going to also recognize there's a lot of futuristic things that are going on. You have, but he's going to always remind you of keeping your mind on the tradition, the great chain of being, the church, and the eschaton. So he's got a. That's that's part of the medic. So you, you you have a foot in both worlds. You can recognize two paradigms simultaneously. But let me just to be a little bit you know wacky. And, and again, I. I try not to be on the internet too much, you know, and that's a great part of write, writing a book and being able to read, just, just getting off it. But, you know, I still, you know, hear things, right? So I guess this week, it's the last couple of weeks that at the UN, and this, even Vogland would say, you know, this world thing is going to kind of come out of at least superficially or uh, at least in appearance, this, or, this organ called the UN. And they put up some creature. I don't know if you heard about this, Will, what it looks like something out of the book of revelation right one of the beasts is going to look okay. like kind of part lion and part what's the beast and then you know so you're finding youtubers that are pointing in at the paw what kind of paw is that <laughs> you know and i'm not saying it's crazy but already there's uh, you know how do we how do we react to this is just the is, are these the elites sucking us into this to create this uh, fake apocalypse and play with the timeline or is this a real thing you know and my take is I try to take these things with a grain of salt now. You know, I think maybe a couple of years ago, I would have been a little more excited and go, aha, <laughs> you know, vindication. <laughs> uh, but so obviously it's very in your face and people are messing with this and it is part of the chaos and the egregore creation. They want a fringe to believe these are the end times. And part of this project that's kind of being, you know, revealed through cultural creation is this idea that yes, we're gonna manufacture an apocalypse. Um, or we're going to manufacture an online. So that idea is out there. Now, is the opposite idea true that we're not doing it? it it's just part of this kind of stew of, of uh, you know, Project Chaos, I, I guess. Um, did you hear about this, this beast outside of the United Nations? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw those pictures. Uh, and, <laughs> and it's like cartoonish. And um, in, uh, in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, a place I used to live, there was this... Uh, a statue of, of Nathan Bedford Forrest that sat like on Interstate 65 for like 25 years, it done in this very cartoonish style, you know, absurdist theater for sure, you know, just as a, a kind of, a, you know, some fuel for the, the whole um, race debate. Uh, meanwhile, there's like an entire blo block of the downtown um, uh, uh, capital of Knoxville, uh, that's named after Albert Pike, but somehow that never gets mentioned in the, um, the whole race debate. So anyway, yeah, the, the, just the formal language of this sculpture was already ridiculous and cartoonish and, uh, you know, incendiary meant to try to cause this type of um, controversy, you know. As you're speaking, I'm thinking of like, uh, every time I fly in to Denver, of course, you, you walk <laughs> and, you know, I because I've been doing that. You know, I've been walking through the Denver airport way back from the day where there were just you know murals. Um, but then you know you start looking at you know the machine guns and the doves and then you know the inverse narrative and it, it's so apocalyptic and in your face. I think a lot of them have been removed. And then you leave the airport and you go. I'm trying to think of the name of the demon the demon pony you know it's the bronco pony it's uh -huh. blue with yeah. that, and, and if you go at night it's got the crazy lit up it's called i don't know the uh, there's a name for it the demon horse and if you have you ever heard of them you know what i'm talking about no, 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 oh that. really yeah. <laughs> okay so it's it, it's it, it's the devil horse so no matter how normie you are you know that's the it's the bronco with the demonic lit up eyes it's and then if the story is true the person that created it the statue fell on him and killed him. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's just, you know, what to make of all this stuff. Um, I don't, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but I think it's part of generating egregores. And I think the cartoonishness and the over the topness is part of the egregore creation. And <clears throat> does the Bible actually talk about these beasts? Yeah, I mean, they could be nations, they could be literal, they could be figurative. Um, I think putting a literal 
figure like that outside the UN or outside the Denver airport is supposed to probably excite maybe a more literal minded person. And again, that that is not the traditional view of the book of revelations that it's going to be done literally and linearly the amillennialist view see the seven churches and the seven lamps as uh, you know opposing pictures that go from the advent of christ to the return of christ throughout time and it's fundamentally not a book about the future because most of these were fulfilled in christ uh, his ascension and the destruction of the temple in 70 a.d uh, but they, they do develop a typology um, but they're more about, you know, when someone like Scott Hahn, the Protestant that became a Catholic comes in and he sees the book of revelations is fundamentally about the mass and the Eucharist and this, the lamb that was slaying from the foundations of the world and that will rule that pre currently rules at the right hand of the father. It's what it's God's one word, the logos that was made flesh, you know, both he's living out here. And we participate in him, both with a uh, mystical body of Christ and in the physical sacraments that he left behind. And he promised he'd be present with those physical sacraments till the end of the age. Now, you know, <clears throat> what do we do with that? For me, I guess that um, uh, the belief in the sacraments is a belief. If you don't think that they do anything, they're probably not going to do anything for you. But I don't know if you want to finish off with any ideas that you have. We talk about an inversion of sacraments. Um, what are, what are, what's anything that's appealing to you about the promise of being um, present in something physical or the idea of transubstantiation that, um, you know, like the majority of modern Christians, American Christians especially, would reject this idea that the 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 you know the the life, soul, divinity, blood of Christ can be present like that. But you've got to remember that was the only show in town from the first century. If you could believe in any of the miracles of Christ, you know, turning uh, bread into you know they. The Christ is saying that I am the manna, that I am the bread, that I can multiply he's all these types that he's saying that I will be present. So when he's, you know, saying this in the upper room or, you know, he's saying it to the crowd that you must eat my bread or must, must eat my body, you know, and, and drink my uh, blood um, that that this, you know, that, that this realization was there, that this this is. This is the pinnacle of the mass. This is the union of us here and this plane of existence with the heavenlies. And we all are one in, in a way that's sort of um, outside of time and space when we participate in the mass. It took, you know, because growing up where you kind of took um, the Eucharist kind of seriously in a Lutheran tradition, it's a whole nother level between how Kelvin would, you know, and you got to say in actual Calvinism, Calvin believed that you were not saved unless you went to his version of the Eucharist or, you know, communion. Luther believed that too. It was until several generations that people, you know, just kind of lost sight of this. This is the core of Christianity. This is the union of heaven and earth. This is the communion of us and the saints. Um, well, I, I, I'm I'm a, I'm running my mouth today. I, that was that was wonderful. Um, I I was just reading here in Vogel and the uh, the problem of an edos in history hence arises only when a Christian transcendental fulfillment becomes immunitized. So an emphasis on only in Christian there, um, the millennialism of say the Third Reich. Uh, or the the last stage of uh, of communism, or um, uh, help me here. What what are some other millennialists? Well, I'll tell you one that's going on right now. It's what they call the uh, New Apostolic Reformation. Yes, and that's right. that's the Pentecostal version of what's more sophisticated that comes out of the 1970s and the 80s within the <clears throat> Calvinist schools of re Christian Reconstruction. Right which is that after the new world order, Calvin's order will finally be able to come in and properly, truly um, substitute for the Christian or the Catholic magisterium. So that's a quiet, it's a small niche of, you know, the intellectual types, the elites, but right. that is part of their vision is that needs to be that thousand year reign. And so that still exists within what you call the 
upper echelon of the most serious of the theologians here uh, in the, well, especially the Anglo, well, I shouldn't exclude places like Holland and so forth, but in the Calvinistic world, it's, they're called post-millennialism, but we see it expressed more in the kind of charismatic Pentecostal version of what we call the new apostolic reformation. Now, yeah. they're not going to kind of give any credence to Kabbalah or anything like that, but they certainly would not want to see themselves of, you know, outside of the will of God or, out, you know, outside of something called a medicsy. But yes, I believe that the proper, you know, traditional understanding of the eschaton is that when Christ said it is finished, that was that the millennial reign, those things that were prophesied are things that are being developed um, in the heavenly kingdom, and they await the union of the new heaven and the new earth. And that's mm -hmm. always been the vision of the church. This kind of post-millennial view slowly started sinking in with the notion of progress in the uh, press, you know, in the in the um, Presbyterian circles in America, because obviously the the world started after after the great sort of bloodbaths of the religious wars of the 16th and 17th century, we started truly believing in science and this idea that there was this notion of progress. And even among Christians, they embraced this idea of this idea that things would get better and better and better. World War One and World War II a little problematic for that, but this group is very real. And uh, it's, 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 so when people just kind of focus on the groups that are the um, the rapture groups, that's one side of this outside of the medicsy. The other side is this idea that Christ will not return until there is this thousand years where Jesus literally comes back and rules from Jerusalem. And it's very real. So you have it in these sophisticated groups of, of Calvinists, not all of them, but they're there. And you also have it with this creation of the Darby Schofield rapture um, scam that's also yeah. going on. That, both that, sorry to interrupt you. Um, that was one of the points of dissension between Valentin Tomberg and um, uh, Rudolf Steiner. Um, you know, and Steiner's uh, Christology, this kind of uh, 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 you know. A new age uh, uh, esoteric Christianity. Uh, they had the view that the you know the the Church of Saint Peter, which is the Catholic Church, that was established in the Middle Ages, had to be destroyed in order for the true Church, which was the the Church of Saint John, which was founded in Jerusalem, for the New Jerusalem to become uh, immunitized. So uh, that you know has some interesting parallels with the the cult of saint the two saint johns and the solomon's temple metaphor in you know freemasonry so you know I, the, the reason i read that quote from vogelin was because the specific christian transcendental fulfillment is being toyed with or reconfigured or transmogrified um through these different millennial projects and seeing it through that lens through the, the lens of the church of saint peter through the millennial kingdom of you know the 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 middle age you know catholic western church is the lens in, in also the sacramental economy that held that in the liturgical uh, cycle that held that church in order with society is a lens in which we can see these millennial, millennial pro projects as reformattings and um and you know a rebellion against it but also having to be parasitically uh, you know use its 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 terms and its uh its orientation it has to reorient the 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 you know the flow of um a spirit of spirit within that structure yeah it was really powerful because we we discussed this this week um tomberg is very thick and very, he's considered one of the greatest esoterics um, but he made this break from anthroposophy with steiner at some point and so <clears throat> steiner himself would have this conversion revelation that the in the depths of his esoteric thinking he would see christ as this pivotal moment in the cosmic history but he wanted to have everything on his own terms and so what what tomberg would say is there is this medicsy and it is essentially the church and any other ideation of the new agers 
um, and he, he himself was still termed a Gnostic Christian, Tomberg, he'd say any ideation outside of the chain of being within the church is essentially parasitical. And so what that means in Vogelin's terms, when you immunitize the eschaton, you wanna take the finished beatific vision of the final uh, completion of the project and the will of, of, of Christ and, and, and the Trinity, uh, of the new heaven and the new earth, the final project, you wanna pull it down and make it here. It's a perversion of the will of God. And so that's a strong accusation. And Tomberg would use a very soft and diplomatic relationship, but he said, essentially, esoteric Christianity, you know, is just, it, all of this new age Christianity is just a flowing, it's a natural conclusion of the Protestant project, essentially. It's outside the medicsy. It's trying to take this beatific vision and put it down. And of course, when you look at people like Steiner, if you want to finish on this one, you did it this morning, like just talk a little bit about Steiner and how you, just a perfect idea of immunitizing um, this finished new heaven and the new earth, what, what Tehard would call the newness sphere, like, like man's participation is literally going to be involved in reforming the earth and uh, outside the kind of will of God, but he would sound very Catholic. Um, but sure, yeah. So like this, um, uh, you know, Steiner was also like he was, uh, you know, it's, it's funny how these people who want to rebel against um, the papal see and the papal hierarchy become their own popes, and that becomes even you know atomized in the sola scriptura Christian of today, who you know it's their personal um, understanding of you know the scriptures and what the Holy Spirit reveals to them that takes precedence. But anyway, uh, that's a tangent. With uh, Steiner, he was also involved in biodynamic agriculture and homeopathic medicine, and this um, this kind of ecological consciousness that you know is very popular, uh, you know, in today in in the uh, 20th century, and how this um, sense of of um, you know ecology presents as a horizontal egalitarian structure that we can all mutually join into. So I'm from Kentucky, and a big um, influence for me has been uh, uh, this. Uh, agrarian writer named Wendell Berry, um, who writes about sort of the um, the health of the organism, and the organism is is the um, the ecological um, you know environment that we all belong to in you know different uh, layers of of, um, of of relations. So like you know the health of the individual is relative to the health of the community, and so. Um, he's been conspicuously silent about, uh, you know, this gene editing agenda and uh, this, you know, overhaul of society, which is very suspicious. And, um, uh, and I see a lot of people on the internet using his, uh, his, his writings as a way of justifying, you know, mandates because our individual health is, you know, essential for the health of the community and sort of inverting his, uh, his writings, but he doesn't seem to have anything to say about that. Um, must be interested in his legacy, I guess. Um, but anyway, uh, that said, it's interesting how ecology and, you know, you'll hear with Archbishop Vigano talking about the Pacamana, Pacamama uh, statue uh, or idol that was worshipped um, in 2019 at the Vatican, which is this kind of um, Amazonian nature goddess and um, this, this, this Gaia worship that's sort of emerging and overshadowing, um, you know, the, the the order of being in which now we have to horizontally relate uh, to all creatures and to the creation in this way that you know we um, we mutually belong. And uh, there's a, a you know the uh, we have to isolate. And we have to alienate ourselves uh, so that we can uh, belong to this this larger order. We have to quarantine so that we can. Um, participate in the greater good, you know, this type of schizophrenic dialectic. Yeah, and when you started talking to me, you were talking about like in uh, art theory, they're really pushing this idea of nodes and a seeming kind of decentralization, but yet at the same time, you're beehived. So it's this kind of a strange thing. But again, when we think about the, the rupture in history that began with the Protestant Reformation and the breaking down of the Imperium, it's natural conclusion of scriptura sola scriptura would be an atomized individual. 
And you were saying this morning, if you were, you know, if you were doing an alchemical project from, you know, uh, 2000 miles away looking on planet Earth, you'd want to break this thing apart. And the Kabbalistic projects really is right that, that, that there are sparks, the divine sparks are all over, need to be regathered into one. So, so again, it's the importance, I was going to say, if you don't want to participate in this Kabbalistic project of everything being turned into one, you keep your eye, the best we can do is stay at peace and keep our eyes on the eschaton. Let me grab a cord here. What do you think, Will? So, so in a way, this ecological consciousness can be viewed as an alchemical fracturing, uh, you know, the solve process that has to be regathered and, or the coagula that has to be regathered res and solved. Um, resolved into this macro organism um, or this collective uh, consciousness in the form of a metaverse or a nunosphere. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I'm, I'm thinking out loud, it's like we are atomized individuals. We're, we're very alienated and isolated. That is just part of the modern condition, right? But yet at the same time, we're part of the internet of things now. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, uh, it, it is kind of strange, right? That this is the this is the burgeoning of a new civilization. And you introduced to me like a New York Times article about a new book and a guy is trying to sell the metaverse and about renting space in the metaverse. And not only do I not even want to get where he's going because I just, it's a repackaging of Telhad's Nooniverse, which is, you know, and Marx's version of the, the base and the superstructure, which is essentially created by these egregores and this dialectic kind of framing. It's just the new, it's a repackaging of something that's been, been around, especially throughout the 20th century. And Steiner was, you know, you know, even though I think he had a sincere belief in the logos was, was part of this project as well. But yes, um, that somehow there's this strangeness that, that we're at lockdown, we're supposed to be at home with ourselves, we're supposed to do everything online, but yet uh, we're in a surveillance society and we're demanded um, to consent, um, not only to being surveilled, but to have um, being injected. Um, and so that consent brings us into something, a paradigm that's just so fundamentally different from Western civilization. And it's kind of pimping off some of those words and some of the fumes that are left of a true, you know, the capacity of the critique or the necessity of criticizing authority, criticizing government to, um, and again, whether or not somebody's in the medical industry or our academics, how people that know better are going along is just the great puzzle that so many of us are dealing with every day. But it is part of the new life in the medicsy. And part of the idea here is, um, I, you know, I know we were going to kind of close this thing down, but we are being dehumanized when we accept these lies. Part of the per perversion is something that's not fundamentally part of reality and true. And when you accept it and go along to get along, you are part of this egregore creation because perversion of the truth is a necessary ingredient. So I hope we were able to give uh, you a little, a little insight into the exchanges that Will and I have been having um, the last week or two um, that we've pulled together a couple of the parts for you. Um, Will, thank you very much for participating in this session of Dr. Deep State and being our special guest. And I want to say goodbye to all of you out there. And I hope everybody is doing well. This has been Dr. Deep State. Thank you all.